In this video, I'm gonna go over the entire photo and video quality settings on the Canon M50. This will be a very in-depth video and I'm gonna go over and talk about every image quality related setting for photos and videos on the Canon M50. I'm gonna go over every single setting and talk about what I personally use for videos and photos, as well as what each setting does and kind of a breakdown on each of the settings that involve photo and video quality on this camera. I recommend watching this entire video all the way through if you have the time to, but if not, it's totally up to you. But this is gonna be an insanely long video, so I'm not gonna waste your time anymore. Let's just get right into the video. All right, so let's dive right into the menu on the Canon M50. So first things first, of course, turn the camera on. And then with this dial right up here, make sure this is set to the M, which stands for manual mode, and that's gonna be photo mode. And the manual will give you basically the most amount of options for the settings uh, versus the other photo modes in this camera. So turn on, set this dial to the M, and then let's dive right into the menu, which is this button right here. So first things first, we're gonna start off on this first photo page and then page number one right there, right on image quality. So image quality right here, you can choose between raw, um, raw, C-raw, uh, nothing, which would be no raw formats, and then JPEG right here between, you know, not taking any JPEGs, all the way between all of these different settings, uh, which is low, medium, S probably stands for superior or high or something, it's essentially the high mode. <laughs> Um, and there's a bunch of different JPEG options there, and of course, two different RAW options. So, if you don't know what RAW photos are or JPEG photos, definitely look into the difference between the two. Personally, I record, or I guess take RAW photos right there, and then I get rid of JPEG, I just shoot RAW photos. And so the difference between RAW and C-RAW, C-RAW is essentially a lower um, file-sized RAW mode, so it's gonna be slightly lower quality probably realistically not noticeable, uh, noticeably lower. However, it's technically a lower quality RAW, which is gonna be a smaller file size. So this is gonna be your highest quality photos that you can get out of this camera right here, which is just this RAW format. So I personally just shoot in RAW. However, I'd recommend only shooting in RAW if you're going to 100% of the time, take your photos from the camera, import them to your computer, edit them in something like Photoshop or Lightroom or any sort of image editing software. If you're not planning on editing your photos at all, you just want to take them in the camera and then send them to your phone or import them onto your computer, post them straight to social media or email them or text them, you know, something like that. If you're not planning on every single time putting your photos into an editing software, then I would recommend shooting JPEG in S2. Uh, it's gonna be the highest quality JPEGs. I really, Personally, unless you need to fit as many photos as you possibly can onto a smaller size SD card, I wouldn't bother with any of these lower quality JPEG modes. I would go straight up to S2 and just use that if you're gonna shoot JPEG. Um, but like I said, if you're always gonna plan on editing your photos and putting them in Lightroom and really doing a bunch of adjustments, I would just shoot RAW. Or if you really don't know what you're planning on doing, I would choose RAW as well as S2. And if you set that, you'll see right there, RAW plus S2. It'll actually take a raw photo and a JPEG photo every time you take a single photo. It'll save both file types on your SD card. Um, and so, you know, then you can either just use the JPEGs if you don't want to edit them, import those wherever you need to on your phone or laptop or whatever, and then, you know, delete the raws if you don't need them. Or if you do need them and you realize that afterwards, you can take the raw files and, you know, edit those and everything you need to. So uh, that kind of took a while to go in depth on that, but long story short, I personally just shoot raw because all the time I just edit my photos in Lightroom. Uh, but you know, you can choose that essentially based on what you need. So next up, uh, the aspect ratio. So the best way to explain this is essentially how wide versus tall your image is. So um, this isn't really the best way to do this. I wouldn't always use this as an example, but this is just kind of the best way to explain it to you for me personally, I guess. So a three to two would essentially be an image um, if it's three inches wide, it would be two inches tall. Um, so pretty much just the ratio between the width and height. And so four by three, you know, it's be four inches versus three inches tall. Six by nine would be 16 inches wide, nine inches tall, and so on and so forth. So one to one would be a perfect square, the same width as the height. Three to two is gonna give you the max ability out of the sensor. Pretty much just um, 
you know, the maximum quality and maximum capabilities out of the sensor because this camera does have a three by two sensor. So it's gonna use the entire sensor without cropping anything. And so I personally use three to two every time and I can crop and post if I need to. However, if I do need a square photo and I just need it straight out of the camera, I go over to one to one, which is a perfectly square photo. But I leave this on three to two like 99% of the time. Image review, this essentially will um, allow you to choose if right after you take the photo, if it pops up on the screen uh, or not. So if it's off, you'll take a photo and it won't show anything on the screen, just you know what's usually on the screen before you take it. And then to look at your photo, you'd have to go right into this playback uh, menu right here to look at the photo. But if you set it to two, four, eight seconds or hold, it'll essentially, you take a picture, it'll bring it up on screen so you can kind of look at it right away afterwards without having to click on this, um, you know, for however long before it goes back to the normal shooting mode to take more photos. And of course, hold means it'll just stay there forever until you like half press the shutter button or something like that, then it'll go away. I set this off personally, but that's 100%, uh, you know, something that you'd choose. This doesn't really dictate any sort of quality. It's just kind of based on your preference. Next up, lens aberration correction. So this is stuff per peripheral illumination correction, <laughs> probably said that wrong, distortion correction and lens optimizer. I personally set these to on. It'll essentially, the camera will communicate with your lens and figure out if you know that lens typically has a little bit of distortion that it needs to correct in the camera and just stuff like that. I turn this on um, and you know, any lens that it supports, like the one I have on here right now, which is the EF 50 millimeter F1.8. Um, if it notices a lens that it supports that with, it'll pretty much adjust the images and just make them look a little bit better. Um, so that's why I pretty much just always keep that on with all of those. So next up, flash control. This has to do with the built-in flash in your camera. Um, there's a bunch of different settings to go through in here. Personally, I don't use the internal flash on any of my cameras. Um, I feel like it just doesn't really give a good look out of the images. Since it is dead straight on from the lens, it usually makes things look kind of washed out and um, you know, just pretty much gets rid of all the shadows and stuff and makes things look a little weird, especially people, um, in my personal opinion. You know, it kind of makes them look like uh, those like instant cameras with the flashes. I don't know if you know like the typical style of those types of photos. That's just my opinion though. Um, if you do plan on using the internal flash, these are all just things to go through and just mess around with. Um, you know, red eye reduction obviously gets rid of those red looking eyes that sometimes flashes give you. Um, you know, all that stuff. External flash settings would be if you have an external flash on the hot shoe here. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that's based on the scenario you're in, you know, what type of flash you're using, um, you know, what brightness the flash is at and that sort of thing. Next up, drive mode. So this is essentially um, the camera, how many pictures a camera will take when you hold the shutter button down. So single shooting, if I press shutter button and hold it down, it'll take one photo, a single photo. If we go over to high speed continuous shooting, uh, shoot speed priority, this will be a high speed. It'll basically take pictures as fast as it possibly can. And it prioritizes the shooting speed, like how many it takes per second over things like the autofocus and stuff. So it's not gonna prioritize making sure your subject can focus, it's just gonna shoot as many photos as it possibly can. If you go to a low speed, that's tracking priority. So that'll kind of more prioritize your autofocus and tracking your subject, making sure it's in focus and everything. Um, it'll prioritize that over how fast it takes photos. So it'll be a slower speed. Um, I'll get to kind of show you an example real quick. So I'm gonna hold it down. Hopefully you could hear that. It was still pretty quick, you know, nothing crazy. Um, but if I put it over to high speed, it took a lot more. Of course, it kind of stopped itself, it reached the limit, um, but it takes them a lot faster. And then you of course have self timers, that's pretty self-explanatory for 10 seconds, two seconds, and then continuous. And that is it for page number one. So on to page number two here, um, there's exposure compensation. So if you have your camera set to one of the auto modes, you can change this to make it um, pretty much always adjust it to be a little brighter or a little darker than usual. I set this at zero just so when I'm in an auto mode, it'll pretty much have everything exposed, you know, 
right in the middle there. Nothing will be super overexposed or super underexposed. That's something that's also based on whatever situation you're currently in while taking photos. ISO speed settings, this is um, for auto ISO as well as just choosing what ISO you're at. Um, again, if you don't know what ISO is and really how it works, I'd recommend looking into that separately, uh, but essentially just set this typically the lowest you possibly can in your situation. And this sets the max ISO, if you set it to auto mode, the maximum that it will allow the camera to go to before it stops. Because of course the higher your ISO is, the blue, not the blurrier, the, um, the more grainy and noisy your images are gonna be. Typically, the higher ISO, the lower quality your images will be. Then this is ISO speed settings for video. It's pretty much the same thing, the max auto ISO for video mode, um, the same thing as that essentially. Then auto lighting optimizer. This essentially um, automatically adjusts the lighting in your photos um, to pretty much optimize it for every single photo you take for the situation you're in. Um, so it kind of does, it, it just does stuff for you essentially to you know optimize your exposure. Now of course right here it says this is disabled in manual exposure. Um, so if you're not in manual mode, you can you know, set this to kind of adjust your highlights and shadows and make it look a little better um, depending on, you know, each picture you're taking. Personally, I don't really mess with this. However, if you do shoot in auto mode all the time and, you know, want to get a little better looking images that, you know, maybe look a little bit more neutral and less over or underexposed and, you know, make everything look a little bit more flat and neutral, um, you can definitely try this out. There's three different settings, low, medium, and high. Um, but personally, I don't mess with that at all. Next up, highlight tone priority. As you can see right down here, it improves grade, gradation gradation, and highlights to, go back to, it, to avoid overexposure in bright subjects. So essentially, that's just what it says. It kind of helps preserve highlights in your photos. Um, so again, if you're not gonna edit your photos and bring them into like Adobe Lightroom or something like that, and do a bunch of adjustments, um, I would definitely recommend turning this on, you know, even just enabled or even enhanced, and it will kind of make your highlights look, look a little bit better. Sometimes when there's like a really harshly overexposed part in your photo, it'll really just look uh, not very good. It'll just be bright white and really harsh and just not look very good. This will help kind of smoothen that out and just make it look a little bit better. All right, so on to page number three. Metering mode, so this is essentially, if you're in an auto exposure mode, this will pretty much decide what the camera looks at to find the exposure for a specific shot. So evaluative metering will pretty much go over the entire screen to find the best exposure for it. Partial metering goes over partial parts of the screen, not the entire thing to kind of find, you know, where to exposed. Spot metering will look at a specific spot on the screen to decide where to expose to. And then center weighted average will pretty much find the center of the image and pretty much find the average exposure for that. And that's how it will expose your photo for auto exposure. But in manual mode, this really won't do anything. Metering timer, this is essentially for the metering mode. Um, but it pretty much, like it says here, choose the exposure value, search between aperture, display period. So it's going to pretty much show how long it you know, shows the specific settings when you're doing an automatic mode. In manual mode, this um, really doesn't do much either. Exposure simulation, I always enable this. This pretty much shows on the screen and everything um, the exact representation of the picture you're gonna take, um, you know, the brightness and darkness of that image that you're gonna take. I would always enable this. All right, on to page number four. White balance right here, this is gonna be the warmth or coolness essentially um, of your images. So I guess a good example of this, when you wake up really early in the morning, there's you know like the sun shining when the sun's rising, it's kind of like a cooler blue color. And of course during the sunsets, if you've ever seen a sunset, it's a really like orange, reddish orange color and a lot warmer color. And even the sun beaming on your skin just is a lot warmer of a color than it is in the morning and even throughout the day. And that's essentially the white balance. This basically, you can change this to make your images look more neutral and pretty much adjusted, uh, you know, for that color balance. So, you know, daylight 5200 Kelvin, this is gonna make 
um, pictures look normal, you know, not look really warm or really cool if you're out in the daylight. So of course for shade, it's a little bit different. Usually, you know, if it's a cloudy day, um, it's gonna look a little bit more blue outside and less warm. And so this will basically make that look neutral and not look too weird. So this essentially just changes, um, you know, how the, the warmth and coolness of your images. Uh, so you can set this to auto. So essentially wherever situation you're at, it'll kind of look at the tone of everything and make it look as neutral as possible. Um, so, you know, if you're really not experienced with white balance and for photos in general, you could definitely set it to auto and get away with that pretty easily, especially since when you shoot raw and you go into Lightroom, you can adjust the white balance to be anything you want. Um, but if you shoot JPEGs, it's pretty much gonna bake that white balance in. So, you know, pretty much just set this to whatever situation you're in. If it's shady, set it to shade. If it's sunny at daylight, set it to daylight. You know, if you're in tungsten light or fluorescent light, set it to those. Then you can also set your color temperature right here to whatever you need to and then do custom ones so you can take a picture of your scene or white balance card to adjust that. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I kind of went really in depth on that. White balance is essentially the warmth and coolness and you pretty much just set this to make, uh, you know, your images and whatever your location you're in with whatever lighting you're in look uh, as normal as possible. Custom white balance, that's of course to get a custom white balance for whatever scene you're in. White balance shift is kind of to shift it to a more green or more magenta tone um, again, if it's pretty much just to make it look as neutral as possible in whatever situation and make it look essentially normal and how it looks to your eyes rather than being really weird and like um, green looking or, you know, warm or cool. Um, basically, the main goal of your white balance and adjusting your white balance is to make white in your photo look like pure white rather than a different color essentially. Color space, there's two options for this. sRGB is the most common. This is what's gonna be displayed on pretty much any social media. Um, most you know, computer monitors use sRGB. Adobe RGB is a wider color um, space essentially. However, it's not as compatible with devices and stuff like that and social media websites as sRGB is. And so I'd recommend just keeping it as sRGB um, because otherwise, if you use Adobe RGB on some like phones or some screens and stuff like that, your photos might just look a little bit weird because it can't really comprehend that many colors. Um, it's kind of a weird thing to think about, but I would recommend just setting this to sRGB. And then picture style right here. This is essentially going to bake in a certain style and a certain uh, look to your images. So you can see they're kind of labeled here. You have auto, standard, portrait, landscape, fine detail. And these will essentially adjust certain things like contrast, sharpness, and the color tones of your photos. And you can even make custom ones as well. You know, of course, monochrome is black and white. Faithful is gonna be a little more contrasty, a little more satur saturated. Neutral, a little bit less saturated, a little bit less contrast. Now, these won't do anything for raw photos. However, if you do shoot in JPEG, these will kind of just change how they look really slightly. I'd recommend setting it to just standard, um, but I keep mine at neutral just because I like to edit all my photos, even if they are JPEGs. And um, neutral just gives you a little bit more room to edit with. That's it for page number four. Let's move on to page number five. So long exposure nose reduction, that is very self-explanatory. If you do long exposure shots, which is essentially like if you do a 10 second shutter where you press the shutter button and it basically is taking the picture for 10 seconds straight before it stops taking the picture, um, that's essentially what a long exposure shot is. And noise reduction on this, um, it pretty much tells the camera it does want to do noise reduction because sometimes long exposure shots will be noisier than regular shots. So this will pretty much just remove some of that noise in the camera rather than uh, you know just leaving it in there like a raw photo. And so I typically set this to off because in Adobe uh, Lightroom and Photoshop, you can do noise reduction. And personally, I just would rather do that because um, I don't really have a reason, honestly, but <laughs> I keep this off and I just do it in my editing software. I like to have the most control of my images. However, um, again, if you're gonna do long exposure shots and you're gonna shoot in JPEG and not edit anything, definitely turn this to on or even just auto so I can decide for you. But personally, I keep this off. 
than high ISO speed noise reduction. So like I said earlier, the higher your ISO is, essentially the worse your image quality is gonna be and the more noise will be in your images. And so this is pretty much a way to set how much noise reduction and higher ISOs the camera adds to your photos. I actually have this set as standard um, just because, uh, you know, I, I, I like to um, have a little bit of that in camera, I guess, you know, most of the time, um, you know, when I shoot JPEGs, when I shoot RAW, this doesn't do anything. It's, of course, a fully RAW image. It won't have any noise reduction. Um, but when I do shoot JPEGs, um, I like to keep this on. I guess it's kind of weird that I keep one on and one off. I really don't have a way to explain that. It's just kind of how I do things. Um, but again, everything in this entire settings tutorial, definitely don't fully listen to me 100%. Use this as a guide to set these where that would work best for you. Everyone is gonna need different settings depending on who they are, what type of photos they take, and that sort of thing. But yeah, I really guess I don't have a full reason why I keep one off and one on. That's just kind of how I do things. Dust delete data. This is kind of a way to um, obtain, da oh. obtain data for removing dust. I uh, use long size software. It's kind of um, for dust removal on a sensor and to kind of cover up that dust and remove the dust from it. Uh, I've never really done that, so I wouldn't really worry about it. Touch shutter right here. So this is essentially, you can take photos by tapping the screen. So if you tap somewhere, it'll focus on that. Once it gets focused on what you tapped on, it'll just take a picture instantly without having to press the shutter button. Personally, I keep that off, but that is completely up to you. And then touch and drag. Um, this is essentially a way to use the screen as almost like a joystick to move around your autofocus point if you have it set to a certain point. Um, so again, that's something that you can use if you'd like to. Personally, I don't really mess around with that. Onto page number six, this is the autofocus menu. So for autofocus operation, I set it to servo autofocus, which essentially means the autofocus will always be running in the background to try to keep focus on whatever your subject is. And if you set this to one shot, essentially when you half press the shutter button, it'll get focus, take the photo when you press it, and then once you let go of it, if the camera's just sitting here, it won't really try to search for focus. Personally, I keep this on servo, um, just because I like it always keeping focus on everything, just so it's pretty much ready for the photo, um, you know, every time, so it doesn't have to only get focused when I half press it, it'll just kind of always be looking for focus and keeping focus on my subject. Autofocus method, I have it set to face priority and tracking, that's what this is, that little face emoji thing, um, and then tracking, so if I tap on something on the screen, it'll track that subject that I tapped on. There's also zone autofocus, which will have kind of a big zone on the screen that you can move around. It'll be, you know, about this, you know, this size of a square on the screen. So just a zone of the screen. And it'll find something in that, typically whatever's closest to the camera in that zone to, you know, pull autofocus for. And then one point autofocus is a small point on the screen that you can put anywhere on the screen. And it'll only get autofocus for whoever is inside of that little square. Personally, I set this to face and tracking because a lot of times I'm either recording myself with this camera, which I wanted to track my face, um, or you know someone else, like portraits or something like that, where I'd rather it focus on the face, or I like to track stuff, you know, whether it's a moving vehicle or you know a, a person where their face is invisible but they're still moving around the screen, where I'd rather just tap on them and have it track them. Eye detection autofocus that is pretty self-explanatory. Um, if you have that enabled, it'll basically track the eye rather than a face for photo mode, which is very useful because the eye is, you know, the thing, of course, when you look at a photo, you're drawn to the eye of a person. Um, you know, it's just human nature, I guess. So having the eye, the main point in focus um, is pretty important for any sort of portraits or photos of people. And so that's essentially what that does, just pretty much focuses directly on the eye rather than just the face in general. And then continuous autofocus um, essentially uh, is the same thing as server autofocus. Um, I actually don't really know what the full difference is between these, but essentially is continuously focusing rather than, you know, not always continuously focusing, just, you know, focusing when you want it to. I have this enabled just because, um, you know, I like the camera to just always be tracking and focus. Like I said with this, just always be keeping focus on what I need it to rather than just when I half press the shutter button. 
All right, next up on to page number seven. Lens electronic manual focus. Um, I actually don't really know what this is. I've never used it and it's probably not something super important. Um, I'll let you look in this if you need to. Autofocus assist beam. So this is that red, it's like a little LED light on the front of the camera and it lights up and it's super bright and super annoying. Um, and I personally don't find it very useful at all. I just find it annoying, so I turn that off. But it's essentially this light to help you get out of focus in darker environments. Um, but personally, I just find it annoying and I don't really find it useful at all. But of course, it could be useful for you. I don't know, but I keep that off. Manual focus peaking settings. So peaking is essentially when you're in manual focus, um, you know, sometimes on a small screen like this, it's hard to tell what's in focus. However, peaking is essentially these red dots. I guess I can just show you. So it is, let me do that, let me bring this down. Okay, so right now, you know, it's way out of focus. So you can kind of see it's getting in focus now. Uh, I guess I can't really get in focus on this actually. I didn't really think about that. Well, essentially, so I'm trying to focus on this grass in the background here. So once it gets in focus, there'll be these red dots uh, that kind of trace around whatever subjects in focus. Um, essentially a way to help you get focus when you're manually focusing. It pretty much just highlights whatever's in focus in these red little dots, which pretty much just lets you know what exactly is in focus at any given time. It's very useful. I always turn peaking on when I'm using manual focus. And these are the things I use. I have peaking on, of course, level on high, essentially shows how many red dots show on the screen at once. I put it on high so it's easiest to see. And then color, you can choose between red, yellow, and blue. I think red stands out the most, you know, for pretty much almost everything. It stands out having these red dots on the screen. And then IS settings, which is image stabilization settings. Um, this is just for video mode. I have it enabled because it pretty much smooths out, you know, the little shakes um, that you have in your video sometimes. Um, pretty much just like it says, image stabilization. So it stabilizes the image slightly. On to page number eight, this is actually movie recording quality. So right here, um, this is gonna be your resolution and your frame rate of the video you're recording. And so right now I'm in photo mode, so this isn't gonna be in depth. So I'm actually going to back out of here, get out of the menu here, and up on this top dial, switch over to video mode. So now once I'm in video mode right here, I can go back into the menu go over to page number one, and here's more in-depth video settings. So that's what we're gonna move on to right now. So of course, number one, shooting mode. So manual movie exposure is essentially the same as manual mode for photos where you adjust everything on your own, your ISO, your aperture, and your shutter speed. You dial that in and set your exposure fully manually. And of course, auto exposure, it's going to adjust your ISO, adjust your aperture, and adjust your shutter speed to make sure everything's perfectly exposed. However, It'll pretty much set everything to whatever it wants to to do that. Um, personally, I find manual mode is much better for recording high quality videos. Um, it's just something a little bit more to learn to make sure you know exactly how to set your you know, aperture, shutter speed, at, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO and everything like that. Um, you know, to make your footage look the best. All right. So movie record quality. This is going to be a resolution and frame rate of the video that you're recording. So if we go to there, there's these two right here, and then if we click on this top one right here, as you can see, there is 4K 23.98p. So that 23.98p, or you know, 59.94p or whatever, stands for frames per second. And of course, 4K, FHD, and HD are the resolutions. So 4K is 3840 by 2160 pixels, um, 3,840 wide, 2,160 pixels tall. And that is Ultra HD 4K video, standard 4K video, like what you'd see on a 4K YouTube video. And that is in 23.98 frames per second, which is essentially 24 frames per second. That's what most people say. 24 frames per second, 60 frames per second, and 30 frames per second. You just kind of round up that extra 0 0.02 frames per second, essentially. So 4K 24 frames per second, 
This right here is the highest quality video you can get out of this camera. It's of course 4K, which is high resolution ultra HD video. 24 frames per second is a standard frame rate for regular motion video. So if you're not gonna be doing slow motion, if you just wanna record regular speed video, 4K, 24 frames per second is the best possible quality. However, 4K, 24 frames per second mode crops in on the sensor, I think an extra 1.7 times. So whatever, whatever it looks like if you're in full HD mode or HD mode, you essentially zoom in 1.7 times on that and that's what it'll look like for 4K. So and same thing with photo mode. If you're taking photos and you switch over to 4K, it'll just zoom in on that image 1.7 times. However, like I said, it's still the highest quality option for recording video if you want 4K video. And then full HD is 1920 by 1080, which is 1080p video, which is, you know, high definition, it's pretty much standard video quality. Um, I guess standard video quality nowadays is kind of moving to 4K. However, um, you know, 1080p is pretty much good enough for uh, posting videos to Instagram or posting videos to TikTok or something like that. Um, typically, YouTube videos now are pretty commonly in 4K. That's pretty much the new standard for that. However, Full HD 1080p is still good quality video and it doesn't crop in the extra 1.7 times on your videos. So if you're not doing um, any crazy high production value stuff, you're just posting to TikTok, you're posting to Instagram, you're posting to Facebook, um, or you're even just recording home videos of traveling or your dogs, your kids, or anything like that, Full HD 1080p will be a smaller video size, a smaller file size, and it will really be enough quality for pretty much anything you'd need unless you want to get into really high definition, higher quality video. So I would recommend this right here, 1920 by 1080, 24 frames per second for any standard motion video that you're not going to slow down to slow motion of anything standard that you want to record a video of. However, if you want to record slow motion video and slow it down in your editing software, this right here, FHD 1080p video at 60 frames per second is what I recommend. You can slow it down by 50%, so you can slow it down to half speed and it'll still look really smooth. It won't look jittery and weird like it would if you recorded 24 frames per second. And you can even slow it all the way down to as low as 40% speed um, in a 24 frames per second timeline. Still get smooth looking slow motion video at 40% of the regular speed. HD at 60 frames per second, I wouldn't even mess with that. That's 720p, which honestly just is not good enough quality nowadays. Um, I just wouldn't recommend using that. And a full HD, 30 frames per second is pretty much another way to record standard speed video. It's only six frames per second more than 24 frames per second. However, it's typically gonna give you a smoother look um, than 24 frames per second. Kind of a way to define these two and separate them movies that you'd see in a movie theater typically you know high-end high-budget movies are typically shot in 24 frames per second so that's going to give you i guess the most movie like look however 30 frames per second are typically what like news stations and soap operas and television shows for the most part lower budget television shows are shot in and it looks a little smoother um a little more like natural movement, smoother movement. Um, but it, something about it, that six extra frames per second makes it look a little bit, I don't wanna say less natural, because if anything it looks more realistic because there's not as much motion blur and you know, moving objects will look really smooth, but it doesn't look as movie-like as 24 frames per second. Um, yeah, I, I don't really wanna go into this anymore. I've been talking about this for way too long now, but that's essentially these. Personally, if you want the highest possible quality, this is your op the best option, 4K, 24 frames per second. If you want just regular quality video for Instagram, whatever, I do full HD 1080p at 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second. I, there's not that much of a difference, honestly. Um, I personally shoot in 24 frames per second. However, you know, a lot of other people shoot in 30 frames per second all the time. Like a, a big YouTuber that you may know, Marcus Brownlee, um, pretty much lives by 30 frames per second. And he makes quite literally almost the highest quality videos on YouTube uh, on the whole platform. So 
it's not gonna change your quality really, just kind of how your footage looks. I, I said I wasn't gonna go in this morning, I did, so let's just back out of here. Um, high frame rate. This is gonna record 120 frames per second, so you can go as low as 20% of your regular speed slow motion video. However, it's only 720p. I personally don't mess with this, but if you really don't care about quality and just wanna record ultra slow motion that goes 20% of regular speed, you can do that um, and just enable that. And then you can't really change anything else once you enable it. It will come right out of the camera as slow motion. So you don't need to edit anything. It'll already, as soon as you record it, be super slow motion video. Uh, however, it doesn't not record any sort of audio. So keep that in mind, it will not have audio. Personally, I don't mess with that at all because 720p just is not that good video quality personally. All right, next up, sound recording. So this is pretty much, as you can see right there, um, the loudness of the sound that's recording. I set this to manual and I usually have microphones that I plug into the side of the camera here. Like the microphone I'm using to record this video. Uh, I just wanna warn you real quick, this might be loud, but you probably hear that tapping. I'm actually using a mic on my chest right now, a lovely microphone. You can plug things like that into this camera. And you know, like I said, when it's manual, you can just move this around to adjust how loud it is. As you can see, this bar is slowly going down. While I'm moving this down, I'm talking at the same loudness. Now it's almost towards the bottom and now it's nothing. You know, now you can barely see it coming up there. So very, very straightforward. It adjusts how loud your audio is being recorded into the camera. Personally, I set this to manual. I do some tests um, and bring it right around the 12, uh, between the 12 and the zero. Obviously it's not gonna always stay the same right now. It's moving around quite a bit. But typically between the 12 and zero is where you want your audio to be, um, you know, on the average amount. You really don't want it to go all the way to zero and peak. So let me turn this up all the way here. And as you can see right now, it's getting very, very close. And you can see there's little red dots lighting up there every once in a while. If I talk really loud, let me get close here. You don't want to see that red. That means it's peaking. That means it's going to distort your audio. Um, and essentially will make your audio too loud for the camera to comprehend. And so it literally cannot record any more data. It's too loud for it to even understand what's going on. And that's what makes your audio sound really like distorted. I really don't even want to try to make an example. It probably just sounds stupid. So um, it pretty much uh, starts distorting your audio, makes it sound really bad. So if you want to set it manually, just adjust this every time, you know, before you record your video to make sure it's between that 12 and zero without really hitting the zero. And then of course you can set this to auto as well. And it's pretty much gonna automatically adjust it so it never gets too loud. Um, I guess if I was snapping consistently, it would slowly lower down until it was normal. Uh, either way, auto is pretty self-explanatory. And then disable, it will not record any audio so your videos will be completely silent. Then wind filter and attenuator. Wind filter is essentially, if you ever heard audio where you hear that that like wind noise blowing directly into the microphone. This, if you enable it or turn it on auto, I guess, it'll pretty much um, figure out when it hears wind noise and it will try to remove it as much as possible. Personally, I don't really find it does that good of a job. It's honestly almost impossible to get rid of that wind noise. So I disable that. An attenuator, um, honestly, I don't even know exactly what that is. You can look at that on your own. Uh, but personally, I keep that disabled as well. That's it for audio right there. And then next up, a lot of these are gonna be very similar to what we just did. So now that you've already seen that, you kind of understand how to change these. So aberration, aberration correction, we've already talked about that. Remote control, um, this is of course, if you have a remote, you know, record, start and stop, um, remote connected to your camera. Time-lapse movie, that is obviously, you, you probably know what a time-lapse is. If not, essentially, you know, almost like slow motion, but the complete opposite where it's very fast. You know, if you've ever seen like a time-lapse of a sunset where, you know, it's like hours and hours of the sun moving and setting, you know, but within a few seconds, that's what time-lapse is. So if you enable this, you can either do these custom ones. So here's scene one, shoot moving subjects, such as walking people. That's gonna be kind of fast, but not super fast. Um, slow changing subjects, such as clouds. It'll be a little more fast paced because of course clouds move really slow. So it compensates that by making it even more uh, fast paced or more, you know, 
of a fast moving video. And of course, you know, if you're doing slowly changing scene in scene three, that'll be even more fast paced or custom where you can pretty much set um, right here, how many seconds between it takes another picture, you know, anywhere from one all the way to, let's see what we can get to here. And for one to 30 seconds. So if it's one every second, it'll take a picture. And if it's 30, every 30 seconds, it'll take a picture. And this is how many shots it will take before it's done. So all the way up to 900 shots from 30 to 900. And this shows how long it'll be recording this video for. So right now, if we do 30 seconds, 900 shots, this is the maximum possible. It will record this for seven and a half hours. And the final video will be 30 seconds long. So it will literally turn a seven and a half hour long thing, whatever you're recording, into a 30 second video. That's how fast it'll be. As you can see, all of this pretty much adjusts based on how many shots and interval seconds it is. And of course the size, 4K, Full HD. In 4K, it'll crop in kind of like it will in regular 4K shooting mode, so keep that in mind. Um, auto exposure is still, if you have it in auto mode, um, you know, if your scene's getting darker or brighter, this will essentially either be fixed at the first frame so when you take your first photo, it'll adjust it to be fully normally exposed, and then it'll keep that exact setting. So if it gets darker outside, it'll get darker in the camera. Or if you do each frame, it'll make sure each time it takes a picture, it's fully regularly exposed. Now, if you want to do a sunset, you typically set it to the fixed first frame because you want to show it getting darker outside. Um, you know, because of course that's the point of a sunset and it getting dark outside. If you do it for each frame, it'll kind of adjust every time it gets darker outside, it'll make it look a little brighter in camera and it can still get some good looking images. And if that's what you want to get out of it, it'll look good. However, you know, it's kind of something that you'd set depending on your situation. Screen auto off, you know, pretty much enabled or disabled. If it's enabled, the screen will automatically turn off and turn blank. If it's disabled, the screen will stay on the entire time. And yeah, that's it. Also, beep as image is taken. If you have sound turned on in the camera, you can set this enabled or disabled. So it'll essentially, if it's enabled, every single time it takes a picture for you know, however many hours you're doing this for, it'll beep. Um, personally, I would never even enable that in the first place. And that's it for time lapse mode. Um, these settings are, yeah, these are all going to be basically the exact same settings as in photo mode. However, you adjust these separately for video mode. So make, make sure you still go through all of these for while you're in video mode from this dial as well, because these will be different in video mode than in photo mode, but they all pretty much do the same things as I've already explained. And that is it for these settings. Now there is these other menu pages over here. A lot of these are essentially more for personalizing your experience on the camera um, and stuff like that, not for the actual quality you're getting out of the videos and photos. Um, in this tutorial, as you can see, this video is already ridiculously long. Also, if you're watching this far, let me know in the comments because this is such a ridiculously long video. I really, really, really appreciate if you did make it to this point. But either way, yeah, all these other menus are essentially um, ways to set this camera up to best fit you personally, but they don't really change the quality of photos or videos that are coming out of the camera. And so because of that, that is the complete rundown on the entire quality settings in the M50 to get the best looking photos and videos out of this camera. This is exactly how I set it up and how I personally use it. And I have taken some awesome looking photos and videos out of this camera in the past. So um, yeah, that is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to my channel and like this video if you enjoyed it. And I will see you in the next one.